Welcome back to Falker Figures. Today I'll be taking a break from unboxing some WWF Hasbros and having a look at their main competitor in the 90s, which was the WCW line by Galoob. Really interesting backstory to this line. Um, lots of interesting parts of the backstory to this line, actually. Um, but as I said, this was the main rival, the main competitor to the WWF Hasbro line. Uh, if I, I think they were released in directly in competition with, I mean, I think the Hasbros came out first, and then the Galoobs were a sort of counter move by WCW um, to try and challenge them in the in the toy market as well. So. Real sort of iconic, like anyone that had Hasbro's had Galoobs, that, you know, it, you always had both figures, both figures from both lines in your fig fed when you were growing up. Everybody did, literally everybody. There was nobody that was just solely a Galoob guy. Certainly in my experience anyway, when when I was growing up, um, nobody just had Galoobs, but everyone had some Galoobs. Everybody had a couple of Galoobs in their fig fed that was mostly populated by uh, the WWF Hasbro guys. So they're almost like an extension of the Hasbro line. They came out in the exact same time period. So 1990 is when Series 1 of the Hasbros came out. 1990 is when Series 1 of the Galoobs came out. They only ran for two series, uh, two series so 1990, 1991. Um, so they didn't last as long as the Hasbro line. And I don't think they were as successful as the Hasbro line. But it's almost like if you're collecting Hasbros, for nostalgic reasons at least, if you're collecting Hasbros, you need to be looking into the Galoops. You need to be trying to pick some of these guys up. So, um, <clears throat> I have here my one and only loose Galoop at the moment, who I actually kind of got by accident because I've had this guy for years, literally years. And the reason I have him is I got a, a Dusty Rhodes, not Dust, Dustin Rhodes, Dustin Rhodes, which was the... Um, the, the guy who was gold dust in WWF before that he was he's the son of Dusty Rhodes Dustin Rhodes uh, now in AEW Cody Rhodes big brother um he was the natural Dustin Rhodes in WCW and he had a Galoob figure and he's one of the more rare Galoob figures one of the figures from the Galoob line that goes for a lot of money and I wanted to get him graded and this is before I really kind of looked into the um the Galoob line I wanted to get him graded but to get things graded, they have to be complete. And all these figures come with belts, like WCW Championship belts. It's just a generic belt. I think it's loosely based on the world title, but it doesn't say world title on it. It just says WCW on it. Um, and every Galoob figure has that belt, everyone. So to get it graded as a loose figure, any Galoob, you need to have the belt. So I bought the uh, the Dustin figure. I can't remember why I bought her, how I came about him. It was years ago, and uh, anyway, I came into possession of this Dustin figure. I knew it was rare. I knew it was one of the more sought after pieces, so I wanted to get it graded, but didn't have the belt. So I bought this Ron Simmons because it had it came in the belt. It only cost like two pounds or something. I got it on eBay, uh, and when it arrived, it's actually in really nice shape. It's in really good condition. Uh, it doesn't have any real damage at all. It would probably grade pretty highly. But what I found out was that um, Dustin doesn't wear the same belt as everybody else. Dustin has a nine-notch belt. I think this one, yeah, so these are six notches on the back of that belt. So, I mean, usually once you had the belt, you could put it on any figure, but no, Dustin's a different mould and he needs a bigger belt. So I couldn't use this belt. Uh, so this figure was completely redundant uh, and he's been in my shelf for the, ever since. He's been kind of tucked away. Um, I've never really thought to sell him or to swap because I, I didn't really, I literally paid like two pounds for him or something. It wasn't uh, anything I thought would be desirable that somebody would want. Uh, so I've just kind of kept them. Never really been big into collecting the Galoobs. I like them. I know of them. And uh, I always kind of keep an eye out for them. But I've never been something I've been desperate to have a full set of or anything. Um, but anyway, so that's why I've got Ron Simmons, uh, who won half of the Doom tag team. Probably better known in his WWF one as Farouk. Um, but real significant in the history of wrestling. I mean, this guy was the first African-American, so essentially the first black guy to win the world title um, in WCW. And at the time, you know, it wasn't just the WCW title, it was the NWA title. So it was like the National Wrestling Alliance. It was, it was a big deal, you know, and, and he um, he was the first guy to do it, the first African-American to to have the world title. So he, is, he 
he doesn't get the kind of recognition he probably deserves because based on his WWF run or WWE run, he's mid-carder at best. You know, he's a kind of a novelty act as one of the, the acolytes uh, as, as Farouk. But um, what he'd done in WCW was, was groundbreaking stuff. And he's a, a really significant player in the history of professional wrestling. But anyway, so as I say, I've had him for ages. Picked these guys up recently though. So these are the guys I'm going to be unboxing today. So this is, uh, as you can see on the card, two of the four horsemen. So the four horsemen was a stable that evolved all the time. I mean, it's, it says four horsemen, but there was always uh, guys coming and going from that from that stable. You know, I mean, some of the, the most sort of significant guys, I suppose, were like Tully Blanchard was was one of them. Uh, Ole Anderson was a, was a horseman. Uh, the Cafe brother of Arn Anderson. But there's some complete joggers, like Mongo McMichaels is one of the four horsemen. Lex Luger, I think, at one point was in the horseman. Um, Brian Pillman was in the horseman. Chris Benoit was in the horseman. So it, it evolved constantly. But these two were probably the most sort of consistent or constant members of the, the four horsemen stable, uh, Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. Um, so that's probably why they made it to a, a tag team say as, as the horsemen. But um, yeah, lots to unpack here because this this is uh, a Series 2 set. So this is the, the 1991 tag team set. Now, I don't know exactly why, but Series 2 of the WCW Galoob line, that's the one you want. Now, usually with, with a standard toy line, the, the, a, a general rule, I suppose, would be the older the better. So you'd think Series 1 are the ones that you want because they're older, they've been around for longer, less of them in good condition. But because of the distribution of this figure line, that's not the case at all. The Series 1s uh, for the Gloob line, the 1990 figures, um, with a few exceptions, which I might come on to in a second, are more or less kind of a dime a dozen, if you like. They're quite, they're accessible, they're out there, they're not expensive. You can get them for the equivalent of a really sort of basic Hasbro. I mean, anybody that's in the first release, the first wave of WCW Galoobs, you're looking at maybe and certainly more than like 40 quid to get to pick one up mint on card. Um, so that's the covenant of trying to get yourself like a, an IRS or a Greg Valentine or something like that from the Hasbro line. It's not, it's, there's certainly nothing <clears throat> significant in that era. However, the first six figures, uh, which were Sting, Arn Anderson, Lex Luger, Ric Flair, and the two Steiner brothers, um, they were almost like a, a, a test run, for lack of a better term. They, they came out as still a Series 1, as part of Series 1, um, but almost like a sort of initial wave of figures that came out. Because Series 1 had, I think, 10 altogether. So who else was in it? Barry Windham was in it. Lex Luger was... Uh, not Lex Luger. Uh, Sid Justice was another one. Uh, and then you would also have had in series one, it would have been Doom, it would have been Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. Yeah, so 10, I think 10 figures in total uh, in series one. Um, but the six that came out initially, they came out with NWA branding. So National Wrestling Alliance, did I say NWO earlier? N NWA, I think is what. Uh, so the National Wrestling Alliance. Um, yeah rather than WCW. So the card is more evident in the singles cards. It was like a superstars of the WCW on these cards. But um, the very early ones were those six figures and just those six figures had superstars of the NWA. And they were like a really limited, almost like a, a t I don't know if it would be like a sample run or something. Um, but anyway, what happened was the, uh, the Turner broadcasting, so Ted Turner, when he bought the WCW and... He, he bought the NWA and kind of established WCW uh, as his flagship brand. He didn't want the wrestlers to be known as, or I say him, not Ted Turner directly, but that, that company. They didn't want the these wrestlers to be known as superstars of the NWA. He wanted them to be WCW wrestlers. So even though the line had WCW branding, it said on it at the bottom of the card, superstars of the NWA. And they were they said that's that's not what we want. That's not the image we want. We want it to be WCW. We don't want NWA referenced. So that line was pulled, or or production was halted on that line, if you like. And the rest of series one all came out with the NWA uh, logo or branding revised to say WCW. So the NWA cards that are like the uh, OG original glue figures, 
Um, and that's the only difference to them. They have the same sort of design, the same pictures, the same wording, but it's just that at the bottom it says superstars of the NWA. Um, those ones can go for big money. But generally speaking, the rest of Series 1, they don't. Um, and then we get on to Series 2, which these guys come, these guys come from. So there were some distribution issues. Again, I, I'm not an expert. I don't know exactly what happened. But Series 2 is more commonly known as the UK exclusive series. Um, I don't think that's strictly accurate. I don't think it is a UK exclusive series. I think what happened was it was released in the UK market first. And then, for whatever reason, the the retailers, the you know, the stores, didn't put in very big orders in the States. So there wasn't that many of them that actually made it to the marketplace. And I think... I think that's what happened. The UK had them first uh, at, at the kind of normal rate and then maybe they didn't sell that well. They didn't go as well as you hope they hoped they would in the UK marketplace. So there was a very limited amount released in the US. Um, and that almost became like a bit of a myth that they were UK exclusive because they were never intended to be UK exclusives. They were just figures that were a follow-up to series, um, to series one and because they didn't sell as well, I think things just kind of wound down in a manner that made it look like they had only been released in the UK, whereas I don't think that was ever the plan, so to speak. But um, yeah, so we turn the card round. Here's Series 2 in the back. So Series 1 guys are all there. There's a few of them missing, so basically, so Arn Anderson, although I suppose he's over here in the, the tag team section, um, Arn Anderson um, should be on there. Barry Widenham should be on there. Um, and they were just sort of, these guys were just repainted. So these guys that were in Series 1, when they came out for Series 2, they were just repainted. So um, with, uh, Pillman, sorry, Pillman, he's not there on there either, but Pillman came out with tiger print trunks in the first wave and then he came out with um, blue blue uh, trunks with tiger faces on them, tiger print paws on them. Um, the Steiners, they came out in a completely different colour scheme. The Lex Luger, again, completely different colour scheme. There was a couple of Sting figures came out. Uh, like I think there was three different Sting figures. Colour variants, Sid Vicious came black in Series 1, pink in Series 2. Uh, Ron Simmons, slightly different figure. He So he came out like this in Series 1. This is a Series 1 figure. His Series 2 figure is a very, very sort of light, well, royal blue, I suppose you would call it, um, on his tights instead of this kind of jean-looking denim blue. And he has a white stripe and it's like, that's it. That's the only difference. But it, it, obviously that's all it takes and it makes it a much more valuable figure. Um, but then you've got these guys. So at the top, the new releases with Series 2, as I say, there's Dustin Rhodes that I had. That's almost an roundabout way why I ended up getting Ron. We've got Big Josh, El Gigante, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, who the, the, at the time, that was the, the fabulous Freebirds tag team. Uh, and these are new figures, completely new moulds, completely new figures. Those go for big money. Those are the guys that you want because they only ever really came out in the UK market and uh, they're very hard to come by, especially in America. So if if you are on eBay or on Facebook or something, uh, American collectors would pay big money for them because they didn't really have a chance to, to own them and there's not that many of them sort of bouncing around the States anyway. Um, but yeah, so these guys are where the money in this line is for collectors anyway. Um so, yeah, Ric Flair and Arn Anderson, these are the guys that I've got today because I feel like I'm rambling on. Uh, the, these are Series 2, Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. If this tag team was uh, in a decent condition, I mean, if the bubbles weren't in a horrific state like they are and the car wasn't in a horrific state, this would be a pretty pricey set to own. Uh, but this is all banged up and shot to pieces. Uh, so no issues. I don't think there's much value to it at all. Um, but yeah, so these guys are in their second colour scheme. These guys came out in Series 1 where um, Rick was wearing sort of baby blue coloured, uh, sort of powdery blue colour tights and, and uh, knee pads. And Aram is almost just another verse of what he's got on here. He was a bit more predominantly white than he White and red still, but predominantly white, whereas this one is more red in his outfit. Um, so these are just the repaints that uh, that come out in Series 2 for these figures. So technically more rare, technically more valuable, but really, as I say, it's those Series 2 only figures. So not the, the real money in the gloops is in the, the new moulds that came out in Series 2, not just the figures that were repainted. 
But anyway, right, let's crack on and get these guys off the curb. Well, Aaron has almost fallen off his bubble anyway. Um, but let's take him off the curb. There we go. There's Arn Anderson. And if we can get... In fact, I'm going to just leave him there and have a look at Arn first. So, Arn Anderson is... Uh, the My memories of him was like, well, who is this guy? Because um, other than very, very briefly when he was in WWF as one of the brain busters, and that was before my time. I think that was the late 80s. I don't think that was in the 90s. Um, I didn't really know who he was. I, I had no idea who Arn Anderson was. And it's only really now looking back at the on the network, you think, oh, he was in WWF. Um, but he was he was a WCW guy, properly a WCW guy. But if you if you know him, if you know who the, who he is, and he's in AEW now as a, a manager, um, that's that's him. That's good. And that's one of the features of the WCW glue line is that they are pretty accurate. They do look like the people they're meant to look like. Uh, and that's a good portrayal of Arn Anderson. But something interesting about the Arn Anderson figure is that I don't know if you can see that, but on the back top of his head, the sculpt actually has like a bald spot. Because as you can see, he is balding. Like even at that time when he would have been, I don't know, 40 or something, uh, he is balding. He's losing his hair. And the sculpt of the figure has like a bald spot. And the very, very first wave, so those NWA cards that came out with Arn Anderson on it, it, it was bald. He had a bald spot painted onto his head. Um, but... I think it was actually the wrestler himself. I think it was Arn Anderson himself that said, I don't like that. Like, do, don't do that. I'm going to not do that. Um, so for all future releases, it was painted over. So it looked like he has a full head of hair. But if you look closely, you can still see the sculpt has that bald patch on the top of his head. So um, yeah, the, the ones that came out early doors that do have the bald spot on his head, they, again, that's one of those kind of niche figures that uh, people would pay big money for because there's not that many of them out there but generally speaking that's uh, it's a fairly solid figure I mean obviously I've not mentioned this yet but obviously I think people would pick up that even though these were rivals for the Hasbro line they're completely unarticulated they're just lumps of plastic there's no moves they don't their arms don't, don't move their heads don't move their legs they're just lumps of plastic but strangely so you'd think well Hasbro's have the edge because of that but they kind of work. I mean, it does kind of work. I mean, certainly figures in the, in the mold of Arn Anderson like that, that that's perfect because you can just like scoop people up. You know, you can be a guy that's getting slammed or something in that mold. Less so with like Ron. I mean, Ron's in a bit of a funny pose, so you can't really do that much with him. But um, but certainly guys like Rick and Aaron in these molds, that was, that was all you needed. That's perfect. And um, yeah, so that's why they kind of worked so well, even though they didn't have the points of articulation of the move set that the Hasbro's had. But anyway, so here comes Rick. Get him out of the bubble. So Rick is in his, so this is a Series 2 attire, obviously, his UK exclusive. Oh man, that's got a big smudge. In fact, he's got a couple of smudges there. That's looks like the paint hasn't really been applied very well on his legs. Um, yeah, so he's in his, his Series 2 attire and one of the biggest complaints about this is that I don't think he ever wore this. He's got a lightning bolt on his trunks and uh, that's not something I think Ric Flair... He's Series 1 in the powder blue, the baby blue. I mean, that was exactly that outfit. You, there's there's footage of him wrestling in that outfit with his initials RF on his trunks. But this lightning bolt thing on his trunks here, I mean, you can see that underneath his belt, it's just like complete fabrication. Like, where did that come from? I don't think he ever had that attire, in-ring attire. Um, but that said, this Ric Flair figure, that is pretty good. I mean, that is Ric Flair's face. I mean, it's, it is a spot-on Ric Flair figure. And I've actually, if I can get him out of his bag, um, hopefully this isn't a spoiler because I'm not sure which, which order my videos are going to come out in, but I unboxed the other day for another video the Hasbro Ric Flair which is there. And if you look at the two of them, like, the Hasbro one, I mean, I said in the video about the Hasbro one that it wasn't a very, I mean, it was an okay face, but not a great face. Compare it to the glue face, it's absolutely shocking. That is a shocking attempt at Ric Flair's face when you compare it to that. Because considering that this was before there was face scan technology, before they could, like, take a digital image and just scan it onto a, a 3D printer or something, that's, that's like a mould. That's like somebody sculpted that. You know, and that is just 
so close, so close to real life. That's a piece of art. Like, I mean, that is that is awesome, the this Ric Flair Galoob. But and as I say, he has this the that kind of stance, he's sort of hunched over, arms are open, perfect for wrestling with. You can scoop people up, slam them, you can also be the victim of a slam. It's a it's a good figure. And because this so these guys came out, obviously, this is the series two wave. These guys came out in 1990 originally, and this so Flair and Anderson were part of the 1990 series one, and um, they were obviously in different paint attire. But th- these were the figures that you had in series one, so you would a lot of people would just incorporate them into their WWF Hasbro fig fade because Rick Flair he didn't come out with the Hasbro's until series six, which would have been at least 92, probably maybe even 90, no 92, I think is a fair assessment. Um, so you, this was the only Ric Flair you had early doors, and you know at that time Ric Flair was in the WWF. He was uh, he was a part of the, the WWF roster, and you needed Ric Flair for some of the big headline matches in your fig phase. So this was the Ric Flair or the the blue pants Ric Flair was the Ric Flair that you had, um, and that was fine because he fitted in really well. He was able to interact. Obviously, you can see it's the same scale as the Hasbro figures, so you were able to. Have a match with Hulk Hogan or Ultimate Warrior or Randy Savage, um, it was perfect. And this, I think, is even now looking at it is a better figure, even though it doesn't move, doesn't do anything. It's it is a better figure than the Hasbro for Flair. Um, but yeah, so the Gloob thing, I I sort of picked these. I'll take Rick back out. I picked these guys up, um, almost as a kind of afterthought. It, I think. I think it was somebody I was buying Hasbro's from had this as well, and I just thought I'll take that as well then. Um, just as a sort of novelty. I don't know that I'm going to pursue um, collecting the whole Galoob line or anything, because that could get expensive. Because as I said, if you look at the, the card back, these guys over here, um, some of these go for silly money. I mean, really silly money. Big Josh. Um, his There's Big Josh and Lex, Lex Luger, who's not on this card, but like an entrance gear Lex Luger are the only two figures in the line that have accessories other than the belts. They all come with a championship belt. But other than that, Big Josh has the axe handle and Lex Luger has like a chain that he wears around his neck. And those accessories are so hard to find that even the accessories on their own will go for hundreds of pounds on eBay. Um, so, I mean, a Big Josh mint on card, without any exaggeration, you'd probably be looking at the best part of a thousand pounds. And I've never seen I've I've seen a couple of really poor examples and people wanting like ridiculous prices for them. But if you got a good big Josh on card, you'd be talking several hundred up there towards a thousand. Same with Dustin, I think. Less so Gigante, you see a few more Gigantes knocking about and uh the Freebirds kind of middle range, but still hundreds, like literal hundreds, multiple hundreds of pounds to get any of these guys mint on card. And even when they're loose, they still go for, I mean, they don't go for a fortune, but they, they still go for a reasonable amount when they're loose. So it's not a line that I think you should really be getting into because even though you can do the bulk of it, you can do the Steiners, do the Stings, do the Lex Lugers, the Doom, Flair, Anderson, Vicious, you can do these guys really cheaply, you can get them on a budget, but when you get to the stage when it's just these guys left, particularly if you're sticking the mint on card, Oh, you've almost backed yourself into a corner at that point and you're going to struggle to get struggle to find them first um, first of all but finding them in good condition is going to be is going to cost you a fortune and it's going to be tough so I don't think I might if more Galoobs come up if I get the opportunity to buy some more Galoobs on card that I can unbox then yeah I might uh, I might take it but I'm certainly not going to go and pursue the rest of the line or anything because um I think it's almost like a thankless task. It's you're not gonna you're not gonna manage it. But anyway, so that's it for this video. I now have a grand total of three WCW glue figures, um, all in pretty nice shape, obviously, because two have just come off the card and one has been locked away for years. But um, yeah, and I think that's okay. I think that's it for me. It's a nice little kind of side chapter to my loose figure collection having a few Galoobs. Um, certainly now that I've got more than just Rowan Simmons, I can actually say oh, I've got some Galoobs rather than just like, I think I've got one somewhere. But um, yeah, so may pick up one or two more. Sting figure's pretty cool. If I could find a decent Sting, I might pick him up. Um, but yeah, so for now, we'll uh, we'll put it on pause. We'll pause the uh, the Galoob collection for now um, and leave it at that with those, those three guys. 
So hopefully you enjoyed that video. If you did, please uh, hit the like button, uh, share the video through social media, leave me a comment, tell me about your gloobs. Um, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and hit the notification bell so that you know that when the videos come out, because there are a few, I have uh, I've got a few in the can ready to go. So there'll be a few coming out over the next couple of weeks. And uh, other than that, stay safe and we'll speak soon.